Ouija was a great photographer. He was an original, but he was also cut up. He was always pulling people's legs, putting people on. He had a lot of fun that way. That aspect of Ouija amused me so much, I sat down and wrote a whole script and talked him into acting out the story of his life, which was a lie, a total lie, for laughs. All during the photography of that great epic, Ouija kept insisting, this is the real me. So, we're going to show you some of that, and also how the rest of the world saw Ouija and his work, and we'll leave it up to you to decide which one was the real Ouija. Let's jump into his fantasy and see what happens. search back to my childhood. Those happy years when our family luxuriated in a fashionable neighborhood. It was an exceptionally clean neighborhood. I can hear my mother now, gently calling to me. We did! I was an intellectually curious child. I found out, however, that the best things in life are neither free nor are they readily available to little boys. So I <laughs> borrowed a camera and went out into the world to make my fortune. The results are history. Anyway, you can see them in my autobiography, strangely called Ouija by Ouija. Disguised as an adult, I attach myself to police headquarters appointing myself crime photographer number one. Most people didn't have front row seats to murders as often as I did. And when fire struck at their homes and their loved ones, I was there, too. Until the last living thing was rescued. And I even uh, had to stay afterward. It was part of my job. Not all of my unsuspecting models were tragedians. We really had a ball in those days. They had some pretty high old times. And I mean... I. Of course, uh, not all of the inhabitants of my naked city were gay in the midst of the crowd. But in the midst of poverty and despair, there was always somebody to warm up the party. Before it ended up in the cooler later on. I worked all night out of my portable office. And I slept all day in my swanky apartment. Eventually, fame crossed my path. My first book of pretty pictures became a popular Hollywood film. <laughs> they even slapped some grease paint on my handsome kisser and tried to make me into a movie star. But <laughs> Cary Grant held firm and refused to panic. This put me in contact with some pretty famous and some famously pretty women about which I could uh, scarcely complain. I became so successful, I even hired an assistant. Then, as the years rolled by, I can't... 
camera began to see strange things. Like this. And this. And this. My world grew topsy-turvy. My life of selfless devotion to humanity left me no new joys for the morrow. While the rest of the world applauded, I was heartsick. For the man who had led the full, rich life, the future was already behind me. The fun was gone. The party was over. The bubble had burst. Gone, alas, was my faithful pussy, long since departed to that big cat house in the sky. Gone was my childhood sweetheart, who they say ran away with gypsies. No good, no good. Alone, weary with the world, I could sit there no longer contemplating the bleakness of my dubious prospects. I decided to end it all, to give New York back to the Indians, to, to find some nice quiet bridge to jump off from. Get along, little doggy. Scram, buddy. Did you not jump, Mr. Ouija? From that height? Forget it. Now, from the docks, you know, near the water, say a backflip, terminating in a graceful swan dive, perhaps. <laughs> Thoughts of self-destruction were erased as I spied a fair damsel in distress. Thrusting aside the crude ruffians who were molesting her, I knelt by her side, hoping she was reasonably intact. Like a Greek goddess, she had temporarily lost an arm in the shuffle, but the rest of the inventory stacked up quite nicely. Here at last was the woman with the strong body and the weak mind that I had always yearned for. Now that we were engaged, I felt we should conduct our courtship elsewhere. As they grabbed her from me, I whipped out my camera to immortalize her on celluloid. Disappearing before my very eyes was my new lease on life. Cancelled by a cruel fate, even before I could move in. When she had sailed off to Europe and I was left alone with my turbulent thoughts, suddenly I remembered the snapshot I had taken of her earlier. Back to my photo dark room, I dashed. But had I remembered to use the right diaphragm opening? Had I selected the right shutter speed to catch her feature? Had I, in fact, remembered to remove the lens cap? This could be my greatest portrait, born of deep and tender affection, a labor of love. I vowed 
then and there to follow her to the ends of the earth. Hey, wait a minute, Ouija. We're getting way ahead of the facts. Let's go back to reality in 1935. Who knows? We might even find that truth is stranger than fiction. New York, the world's largest city, was one of the world's bluest cities, still down in the dumps of the Great Depression. Old jobs had long since vanished, and new jobs were almost impossible to find. The nation and its unemployed were truly in the soup. Thousands were forced to live in shantytown shacks, throwing away with materials from junk heaps. Meanwhile, down in Washington, the president was wheeling and new dealing, trying to reorganize the economy with the help of Congress. While in New York, with liquor legal again, the bootleggers were trying to reorganize their economy with the help of machine guns. It was a field day for newspapers as they blasted readers with the latest murders and juicy scandals designed to shake their readers out of their depression blues. And into this free-for-all, Arthur Fellick jumped at the tender age of 36 as a freelance news photographer without assignment. However, it became clear that city editors had plenty of conventional photographs from their own staff cameraman. If he was going to sell his pictures, he was going to have to come up with something unusual the staff men overlooked. So he headed for South Police Headquarters in downtown Manhattan, holed up in a room across the street, Center Street. This way he could teletype us and possibly get the jump on his competitors. He even managed to be the first news photographer to be permitted to install a police radio in his own jalopy, all the better to chase after the cops and robbers. This often enabled him to be Johnny on the spot, as was this unfortunate recipient of gangland bullets, who had obviously sung his last solo, Oh, Solo Mio. News photos of fires were usually just a lot of smoke, water, and flames, as there were in this flankfitter factory fire. But in his picture, Arthur also made sure he recorded the cooking instructions, simply add boiling water. Arthur worked up so many gang quarters of murder and pictures by turning his camera towards the living bystanders. Many people think that this was Arthur's greatest contribution to news photography. For when all the other cameramen were firing at the news event, Arthur reversed his aim and focused on the victims, the onlookers, the cops, and the firemen. He captured the human side of the news. Even back in those days, Arthur had a fatal fascination for store window dummies. Possibly it was because they were so helpless in a disaster, such as when he told them one of his corny jokes. And of course, they never ever complained either. Editors began to marvel at Arthur's luck in so often being able to be at the right place at the right time. Some people said, he's got to be psychic. For instance, one night in Chinatown, for no particular reason, he snapped a picture of the street corner at Mott and Pell Streets. As he was strolling around nearby, the water main erupted and the gas lines exploded into flames. He dashed back to complete an amazing before and after set of pictures for the morning editions. He must have an Ouija board, people said. So Arthur adopted the name Ouija. Of course, he couldn't spell the word Ouija worth a damn, but who cares when you're famous? Ouija knew all about poverty, having run away from home in the slums at 13, working as a busboy, a dishwasher, and at other menial jobs. So whenever the murders and fire stories slacked off, he would go back to prowl over the turf he knew so well, photographing the poor, 
the downtrodden, and the tragedies of slum life with such obvious feeling that it reaches out and touches our feelings too. Moving uptown to the Metropolitan Opera House one night, while the audience was arriving, Ouija shot one of his most famous pictures, which he labeled The Critic. Unable to forget his humble beginnings, Ouija liked to poke fun at privilege, though he did it more with humor than malice. Thank heavens Ouija was an inveterate people watcher. He probably scared the daylights out of them with his flashbulbs, but we had the fun of seeing them before the self-conscious surprise sets in. His pictures were simple and stark, undiluted by sophisticated photo techniques, you know, the kind of pictures you and I might take if we'd only take them. A new kind of line made up of young girls called Bobby Soxers was forming outside the New York's Paramount Theater to see and hear Frank Sinatra bask in the ululations of his adoring fans. Ouija, of course, was there too to record the phenomena. And to do this, he swiveled back and forth between the crooner's romantic cause and its effect upon the female of the species and the mass hysteria of several thousand other fans, all screaming at the same time, Frankie! June. Um. Ouija covered the circus each year, and today he's doing it as a clown. The day paid off when he was able to zap the Duke and Duchess of Windsor with his trusty flash gun. In 1940, Ouija joined forces with PM, a new newspaper, which at last was happy to give Ouija full credit for his photos. They even featured stories about Ouija, whose behavior was often as startling as his pictures. For instance, years later, in a TV interview, Ouija made the deadpan claim that he was the world's greatest photographer. When asked, yes, Mr. Ouija, but what about Steichen? Ouija answered with mock innocence, who's he? But in fact, it was Edward Steichen who invited Ouija to exhibit his work at the prestigious Museum of Modern Art in New York. His Coney Island crowd was the biggest and most popular picture in the show. So I directed my search party toward the city of love. Not brotherly love, man. This is Paris where romance hovers in the air like an aerosol spray. Some guy, by the name of Eiffel, had gone and built a hell of a big tower for a television antenna. Of course, the minute you throw up something big, everybody wants to scramble up to the top of it in a hurry. I never did particularly like this business of waiting on lines. Sometimes it takes so long you forget what you're waiting for. But somehow, I felt I ought to get up there on top real quick so I could use my telephoto lens to scar the city for possible sight of my dream girl. I finally decided to take the shortcut since everybody seemed determined to wait for the elevators for who knows how long. It seems I had taken the long cut, but when you're a magnificent physical specimen like me, those stairs were really nothing. I was fit as a fiddle and ready for love, so I bounded up those stairs two, sometimes three at a time. Oh boy. To show my contempt for those lily-livered sissies who use the elevators, I turned and throwing caution to the wind, zoomed up the remaining stairs like I'm that TWA jet. At last, all Paris lay at my feet. That is what was left of my feet. I turned my attention to the search for other riches in this hotbed of culture. And there it was, early romantic architecture at its best. My goodness, architecture too! The 
sudden appearance of a caretaker, however, interposed what I considered to be a disturbing note. This was my lucky day. At last I was going to meet a television star. Doggedly I trailed her footsteps, concentrating on her terminal aspects. Was she French, or was that a Swiss movement? I waited outside while she changed her uh, vest. Oh, east is east and west is west. And now, Television Française is proud to present a half hour devoted to Danish cruising. I stumbled onto a unit shooting a cooking program about Danish smorbrod. The sort of thing you would expect that I find to be rather dull and uh, flat. <clears throat> it was at this juncture that I became aware of the inappropriateness of my rather casual sports attire for advancing my position as a potential student at this particular fountain of wisdom. I figured I'd disguise myself as a smoked salmon and see whether I could sneak into class as a small broad special. Having checked the curriculum with our small broad expert, the teacher was rolling up her sleeves in preparation for getting down to the underlying principles, which turned out to be pretty impressive when she finally got down to them. Basically, if you have any cold salami or, say, leftovers from a cucumber salad with anchovies or such, you've got the s'more broad problem licked. You keep the stuff from falling off onto the floor by using whole grain bread, you know, the, the kind with the coarse snow tire tread. This was the strategic moment to move in with my camera to record for posterity the major developments which might stick out in a student's mind. The teacher in time began to exhibit some small concern about the direction my interest was taking, fearing that I was leaning only toward the more prominent details of the lesson. Danish tradition dictates that small broad be accompanied by certain alcoholic liquids with which to wet your whistle, the better to express your appreciation of a dish like this one. Personally, I had a hard time reconciling all this attention to alcoholic beverages, which I felt was driving me away from the meat of the subject. While I was trying to review an earlier part of the lesson, Hello was hard at work attempting to add to my already highly volatile fuel content. With all this liquor she was pouring into me, this girl was giving me a strong desire to go to bed, alone, and for a week or two maybe to sleep the whole thing off. In 1945, Ouija came up with a bestseller book, The Naked City. 
containing a decade's worth of his exceptional pictures. This made him quite truly at last Ouija the Famous. Broadway columnist Mark Hellinger acquired the title for Universal Pictures and produced the theatrical feature The Naked City, which was directed by Jules Dessin. It was the first modern Hollywood movie to be shot entirely on location in New York, and it won an Academy Award for that distinction. The star was Barry Fitzgerald, with walk-ons by local celebrities, including the old Yankee clipper himself, Joe DiMaggio. One of Ouija's favorite hunting grounds was Sammy's, a joint on the Bowery which was popular with the upper class as well as with the hoi polloi. Everyone from businessman to bums could be found here nightly. The only requisite was the price of a drink. And this is the only time Ouija has been seen with a cigarette instead of a cigar, probably because of some distraction or other. Tonight, there's a publisher's party celebrating Ouija's second book, Ouija's People. Ouija himself is disguised as a Keystone cop, and he's having a ball arresting the celebrants with his trusty camera and flash gun probably with his third book in mind. A very good time was obviously had by all, but then eventually, as is bound to happen, all good things must come to an end. Flushed with success, Ouija tested the treacherous waters of matrimony. He was reported to have propositioned his attractive bride-to-be minutes after he met her, saying, Are you single, free, and footloose, babe? I'm going to take you under my wing. But alas, the marriage did not survive for long. So, taking Mae West's advice, he headed out for Hollywood, which he called the land of the zombies. His arrival was saluted by Hollywood starlets. It was staged at a freight car in keeping with Ouija's humble image. Just what the tuxedo was doing in the picture is puzzling, possibly in case he landed a character role. Perhaps he's planning to bump into Mae West. Capitalizing on the obvious, RKO cast him as a street photographer in a Cary Grant feature. He acted as a prize fight timekeeper in another picture called The Setup. For some time now, he had been experimenting with what might be called psychedelic movies. They were made with what he called his subconscious movie camera and elastic lens. Never one to hide his light under a bushel, Ouija decided to show his movies to Hollywood to help it scale the heights of cinematic artistry. Several movie stars and producers turned out for the event, and Charlie Chaplin is quoted as having said that Ouija's film on New York was the most beautiful and sensitive thing he had ever seen. Poking his camera around the studios and flesh pots of Hollywood, Ouija, with Mel Harris, who wrote the captions, came up with Naked Hollywood, a book as irreverent and impudent as the caricature of Marilyn Monroe on its cover. Ouija produced some fresh angles on such glamorous stars as Roy Rogers' Horace Trigger and Jane Russell. Back in New York, Ouija began to exploit in earnest his photo distortions, which he used principally for the purposes of caricature, such as this one of the nation's number one private eye, J. Edgar Hoover and Doctor of Philosophy, Fidel Castro, whose speeches rarely last less than five hours long. And of course you can figure out who this is with such a magnificent mustache, right, Salvador Dali. Oh yes, mm, that's right. I was walking down the rue something or other when I spied this rare piece of sculpture in a shop window. Ah, an intuitive artistic appreciation indeed. Through the finder of my camera, there suddenly popped into view a most welcome sign announcing the availability of this treasure for a mere 10% down in cash. Surely my meager pocketbook could encompass this minuscule payment, so I hastened to inspect this newfound prize at close range. Reverently, I ran my hands over the flowing lines of this sculptor's dream. It seemed to spring to life as I imagined myself the proud patron of the arts. Mm. 
The little man, undoubtedly left by the owner to mind the shop in his absence, scurried over to me, muttering some wild hallucinations in the prevailing foreign language. Bonjour, monsieur. Où désirez-vous aller? Not to be sidetracked from my principal resolve, I pressed him with whatever cash I had on me. Asseyez-vous donc. Je vous en prie. Je vais vous montrer nos dépliants. But for some reason, he seemed anxious to sit down to talk things over. His sly, criminal face cautioned me to humor him. He was broaching some outrageous plan involving a fast getaway to Hawaii, out of reach of the French police. My sole reason for enduring his presence was to arrange acquisition of the art treasure in the window. But evidently, he did not comprehend my best pitch in English. How to deal with this dilemma? But my years of watching, I was a spy for the FBI paid off as I distracted him with an unexpected ruse. This time I'd really thrown him off balance. Quickly I rushed in to capitalize on my advantage, and in a short but furious encounter, during which I relied on my experience as a part-time subway guard, I managed to clear the decks for fulfillment of my role as an avid art collector. A funny thing happened on my way to the Louvre. Another collector spotted my new find. Whether he was interested in the sculpture or me, I didn't wait to find out. Good scalawag Voltaire, however, got a big charge out of the new crop in his garden. As did some other students of the arts. What he could want with me was puzzling, since I had left him the sculpture to play with, but I saw him galloping through the sagebrush behind me, so not taking any chances, I lit out for higher ground. Mais qu'est-ce que c'est C'est pas long short, merde alors Hello, big boy. How's about it, you? <laughs> this was too good to miss. For there, across the street, was an extraordinarily well-equipped atomic reactor plant. Undoubtedly one of those new commercial installations operated privately under some sort of government supervision. I could tell with my experienced eye that this was the type of reactor that employed heavy water instead of graphite, since the latter is rather messy and tends to smudge unless you wear gloves. <laughs> I lost my pursuer in the hilly streets of Montmartre, where Paris rises closest to heaven in the vaulted domes of Sacré-Cœur. Next to the church of the Sacré-Cœur, the place de Turt falls somewhat short of heaven, but its residents attempt to capture the divine spark of transcendent art for direct sale to the visiting hordes of cash-and-carry art lovers. This 
racing around in the rarefied atmosphere of the Boot Montmartre call for a quick pit stop for refueling. over the bill of fare, which looked more like a bill for the French national debt, I decided not to go the whole hog, but only to order a couple of hunks from it. Plus a goodly portion of their best radiator antifreeze fluid, just in case the weather should suddenly turn colder. The tourists were really swarming upstream now. The nets and the lobster traps were well distributed over the rapids and the fish were really leaping at the bait. One angler was pulling in a couple of beauties with his patented lure of offering to paint their portraits in the nude. Obviously, this artist had more designs on the girls than he ever planned to have on the canvas. Maybe this artist routine was the answer to my problem of how to win friends and to influence people. Female people, that is. After all, what did this guy have that I didn't have except possibly a beard and a folding easel? What am I worrying about? I am an artist. And there's an easel. And all we have to do is to reach into our old fuller brush kit and bring out our samples as bait. Suddenly, in front of the cheering crowd of admirers, there stood before me a vision of loveliness. Guard in dungarees, by Dior, no doubt. A strike on my very first cast. I delicately reeled in the line, offering to etch her portrait in silver oxide, as I had done for so many other notable figures, such as this shy folk singer I met at a Greenwich Village Hootenanny. <laughs> Another admirer interrupted with praise for my work, which I accepted in full humility. Bravo, cried a traveling art editor from Time magazine, who insisted that my work was the greatest thing since tic tac toe. As the crowd surged forward, begging for my autograph, I realized that I was really too downright popular to expose myself safely to such spontaneous outbursts of hero worship. Somehow, I would have to soften the impact of my dynamic personality, elicit a little more relaxed response from the ordinary mortals with whom I desired to have a closer contact, like uh, girls, for instance. Having conquered New York and Hollywood, Ouija came to roost in London's Trafalgar Square, where he was wildly acclaimed by the pigeons. However, when Ouija got out, his camera the London Bobbies didn't know whether they were coming or going. During the summit conference, Ouija memorialized England's Harold Macmillan, France's Charles de Gaulle, America's Dwight Eisenhower, Russia's Nikita Khrushchev, and Germany's Conrad Adenauer. The French welcome Ouija too. Their tradition includes a whole newspaper caricaturing current events in satirical prose and pictures. <laughs> and talk about naked cities, Ouija felt right at home in Paris with so many of its natives already naked. He even invaded the sacred territory of Picasso, taking one of his famous pictures, which Ouija felt was a bit lopsided, and quote unquote, correcting it. Now why didn't Picasso think of that? I mean, I bumped into myself, in a mirror, of course, and I realized that if I was to become recognized as an artist, I must assume the traditional costume connected therewith. To be a painter without a beard is like being a hippopotamus without hips. It shouldn't happen to an artist, and it shouldn't happen to me. 
no problem making a beret, but a beard, hmm. I figured this guy might have some old beards around which he cut off during the stainless steel razor blade craze. The laughing boy didn't speak English, but he would deliver anything I wanted if I'd climb into his little joy wagon. This could lead to anything, but I figured I'd better humor him. After all, he was the one who had all the razors. Since I hadn't changed my shirt for several days, I didn't know what the towel was supposed to protect, maybe the beard, if I ever got it. Then he started to undress me. You know, take my hat off. And I had to draw the line somewhere. Either he was going to give me a beard on my chin, or I was going to give him a punch on his. I was going to count to ten, and this joker was going to come up with the beard I ordered, or else. apparent that I had not succeeded in transcending the language barrier. He had given me the wrong color beard, which I politely returned to him with thanks. have touched some sensitive point in his professional pride, where he countered with a cutting rejoinder. The issue was on the verge of becoming something more than an exchange of pleasantries when his delightful gal Thursday intervened, while he went in search of his French English dictionary. Speaking the universal language of love, she was able to whisper sweet nothings into my ear, which changed my whole outlook on the situation. she proceeded to narrow the gap that had developed in Franco-American relations. She insisted we extend hands across the sea, the sea still somewhat flecked with whitecaps. As a conciliatory gesture, I reached for one of my special cigars. But of course, ladies first. And then the rest of the girls. Touched by the unexpected generosity of my gesture, he reciprocated by coming up with one of his special cigars. The torch of good fellowship was passed from cigar to cigar, and as he filled his lungs with the mild smoothness of my expensive Corona Corona, his eyes glowed with deep satisfaction and warm gratitude. Departing in a cloud of friendly cigar smoke, I noticed a strange similarity between his cigar and mine. had my shot at the younger set and had missed by a mile thus far, I thought maybe I should operate closer to my own age level. These little nifties, although they had obviously been poured over by itinerant window dressers for some time now, looked, nevertheless, like they still had some of that old get up and go. Bonjour, monsieur. Vous désirez? I explained I wanted one of those gals in the window. Oh, mais ils sont trop vieux pour vous. I had the funny feeling that someone was watching me. Oh, pardon. Could it be my dream girl? 
Did she resemble my only snapshot of her? What I needed now was underlying identification. Monsieur, what is you? Well, as I was saying, I told the lady about my lengthy pilgrimage here from America and how I felt under the circumstances that maybe I'd be willing to settle for a two-dimensional instead of a three-dimensional plaything. In which case, one of the babes in the window would do just fine, in view of the fact that my 21-day round-trip excursion ticket wasn't getting any younger. again, only this time I wasn't sure which one of us was supposed to be the morning line favorite. Youth was on my side. For I must have been born a full 20 minutes his junior. The only tourist attraction I had missed was the Paris sewers, and that was obviously going to be the next stop. However, we somehow missed the sewer, and I came up into a relatively new apartment house, built right after the revolution. Uh, the Roman, not the French Revolution. dummy I found I was trapped in a dummy factory but right off I bumped into a bay with one of our biggest guilt complexes I had ever seen frantically I'm looking for a way out when by chance I found my way in to the hospital room and darned if the patient wasn't my old girlfriend who had been brought back into dry dock for a complete rehabilitation job I marveled at the wonders of modern surgery what these guys can't do today. But when I realized he was going in for major surgery, I withdrew my permission, saying I'd take her as is, FOB factory, even without the 90-day guarantee. I insisted that he restore her original equipment. I wanted all the accessories, two legs, two arms, two... <clears throat> but then he was finished. We drank a toast, with Rotgut 57, which was a very good year for Rotgut. And then I figured I'd better scoot with the loop, you know, move faster with the plaster. Eddie, it's you and me, see? All the way, kid. And when we get back to Manhattan, I'll buy you a Dynaflow dishwasher with two-tone decorator colors of your choice. Now don't move, dear. I'll get your wrap. There was my nemesis waiting like a stage door Johnny. Like the show was over and he was waiting to take me home to the Bastille. But actually, me and my girlfriend had a date already with a nice big jet out at all the airport to fly us home to New York. So I disguised myself as a little flower girl carrying my lunch in a paper bag.
so there you have it, the two faces of Ouija. On the one hand, there's Ouija, the mischievous leg puller and perpetrator of the preposterous spoof we've been seeing, which, let us remember, he did insist, is the real me. On the other hand, there's the self-taught artist Arthur Fagg, who retained the point of view of his underprivileged beginnings, focusing on the victims of privilege and on bringing down the mighty and the pretentious a peg or two. People said he must have had a Ouija board, and even though he misspelled it, Ouija became his famous trademark. Perhaps in a way, Arthur Fagg and Ouija were all these things at the same time. Poser, primitive but powerful artist, social commentator, hail fellow well met, and an innocuous comment. So perhaps the question, which one is the real Ouija, is beside the point. After all, he used his very own personal point of view to get a rise out of us with his simple and powerful images. They make us laugh, they move us, and make us feel. And that's certainly enough for any artist to aspire to, and that then must be the real Ouija. This devotion to humanity left me no new joys for the morrow. While the rest of the world applauded, I was heartsick. For the man who had led the full, rich life, the future was already behind me. The fun was gone. The party was over. The bubble had burst. Gone, alas, was my faithful pussy, long since departed to that big cat house in the sky. Gone was my childhood sweetheart, who they say ran away with gypsies. No good, no good. Alone, weary with the world, I could sit there no longer contemplating the bleakness of my dubious prospects. I decided to end it all, to give New York back to the Indians, to, to find some nice quiet bridge to jump off from. Get along, little doggy. Scram, buddy. Did you not jump, Mr. Ouija? From that height? Forget it. Now, from the docks, you know, near the wall. He had a lot of fun that way. That aspect of Ouija amused me so much, I sat down and wrote a whole script and talked him into acting out the story of his life, which was a lie, a total lie, for laughs. All during the photography of that great epic, Ouija kept insisting, this is the real me. So, we're going to show you some of that, and also how the rest of the world saw Ouija and his work, 
and we'll leave it up to you to decide which one was the real Ouija. Let's jump into his fantasy and see what happens. I search back to my childhood. Those happy years when our family luxuriated in a fashionable neighborhood. It was an exceptionally clean neighborhood. Ouija was a great photographer. He was an original, but he was also cut up. He was always pulling people's legs, putting people on. I can hear my mother now, gently calling to me. Ouija! I was an intellectually curious child. Ouija, where are you? I found out, however, that the best things in life are neither free nor are they readily available to little boys. So I <laughs> borrowed a camera and went out into the world to make my fortune. The results are history. Anyway, you can see them in my autobiography, strangely called Ouija by Ouija. Disguised as an adult, I attached myself to police headquarters, appointing myself crime photographer number one. Most people didn't have front row seats to murders as often as I did. And when fire struck at their homes and their loved ones, I was there too. Until the last living thing was rescued. And I even uh, had to stay afterward. It was part of my job. Not all of my unsuspecting models were tragedians. We really had a ball in those days. They had some pretty high old times. And I mean high. Of course, uh, not all of the inhabitants of my naked city were gay in the midst of the crowd. 
amidst of poverty and despair, there was always somebody to warm up the party before it ended up in the cooler later on. I worked all night out of my portable office. And I slept all day in my swanky apartment. Eventually, fame crossed my path. My first book of pretty pictures became a popular Hollywood film. They even slapped some grease paint on my handsome kisser and tried to make me into a movie star. But <laughs> Cary Grant held firm and refused to panic. This put me in contact with some pretty famous and some famously pretty women, about which I could uh, scarcely complain. I became so successful, I even hired an assistant. Then, as the years rolled by, my camera began to see strange things. Like this. And this. And this. Turvy. My life of 